Welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us. We'll begin momentarily. Welcome to the East West uh, webinar on China Plus One, Unlocking Business Opportunities in a Changing ASEAN Market. Uh, my name is Alex Bryant, uh, President of East West Associates. Uh, we will have two speakers this morning. One is Mark Plum, he's the Director of East West Associates and former President of Bridge and Stratton Asia, uh, who is based in the U.S., and John Anderson, Vice President and Managing Director for East West and Asia, who is based in Shanghai. Uh, we want to make this an interactive webinar. We want uh, the participants to ask a, series, a lot of questions uh, throughout the whole webinar. If you look on your control panel on the right, there's a place for you to ask questions. As your moderator, I'm the only one that sees the questions, and then I'll be forwarding those to our speaker throughout the webinar. Just a brief introduction on East West. We are founded in 2005. We've got offices in Asia. In China and, and uh, partners in, in Thailand and elsewhere in Asia. East West executives have all lived in Asia and China and held senior level positions and PL responsibilities, specifically for Western companies operating in Asia. Our core capabilities are only focused on commercial operational risk management solutions and then the subsequent implementation on the ground. Our core areas of practice are primarily performance proven restructuring plant closures, relocations, construction site selections, the executive recruitment interim executives. Fourth is theft and corruption, uh, particularly background checks and fraud investigations. The fifth is M&A due diligence for mergers and acquisitions. And the sixth is corporate asset protection and crisis management. So today's agenda, we're going to focus on two objectives. One is to identify the business opportunities incurring on the ground now in ASEAN markets. And the second is to leverage those opportunities of how we leverage those in the ASEAN markets. So to do this, we've broken this into three presentations. The first is a brief overview of ASEAN. The second is an explanation of the process requirements to do the ASEAN, ASEAN expansion. And third is a case study um, of a Midwestern manufacturing company who has a existing China op manufacturing operation who uh, had East West assist them in the development of a site selection and the development of a second manufacturing plant in Thailand. So I will now uh, turn the presentation over to John Anderson and Mark Plum, who both make presentations throughout the webinar. John, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, what we just wanted to start with briefly, some of you may or may not be familiar with uh, what ASEAN really is made up of. Uh, the term is thrown around a lot, but uh, it's very specific. And essentially, it's a group of uh, 10 companies, countries in Southeast Asia that are bonded together for mutual trade and development benefits. So they work together to uh, encourage the growth of their GDPs and so forth. I would point out that uh, not all of these countries are at the same stage of development. So they are somewhat um, mutually interdependent uh, and cooperate quite a bit, but they have the advantage of free trade amongst these and also some uh, intellectual property protection and uh, serve a very large market as you'll see later. 
Uh, also, uh, China is not a member of ASEAN, but they are uh, have observer status. So there is uh, some of the benefits of ASEAN, uh, vice versa, accrue to China and back and forth. So uh, it is a uh, formidable economic zone with a lot of potential, as you'll see later. So why, why would you be interested in ASEAN? Um, many of you may have operations in China and you've seen uh, a lot of changes. I went to China in 1995. They were eager for any kind of investment whatsoever and they were still in the growth at any cost mode. And over time, as China has developed and they've shifted their emphasis a little bit from exports being the world's uh, uh, factory into being the world's consumer, uh, some of those benefits of being there, the financial advantages have diminished a bit. As the economy matures, wages are going up on purpose. The Chinese government is behind that. Tax incentives uh, are disappearing except for very specialized areas. So uh, the financial benefits of China have diminished a bit. Um, and ASEAN represents opportunities for both financial and operational advantages. These are just a few here, but we'll talk about more of these as we go on through this presentation. So then uh, the question is, what does ACN have to offer? And I will turn the microphone over to Mark Plum at this point. Ah, good morning. Or, and good evening. Yeah, as John said, uh, the uh, China has changed quite a bit over the last 25 years. And um, and in the, the basically with their economics and, and their the political structure, we all went to China, you know, 25, 30 years ago. We went there for low cost. We went there for you know potential domestic market. We went there. We went there for uh, you know, there was very little very little competition, and foreign brands were were a big deal. So, for example, in my personal history, I took my first company to to uh, to, to to Asia as a as a manufacturing entity to Thailand in '91 with train air conditioning. We went there with with the joint venture. The primary reason we went there was to sell into Indochina because <clears throat> excuse me, because China at that time really hadn't taken off as well. Then after we established our Indochina business in '96, I then took train in addition up to China in the Shanghai area to compete in China with uh, to, to to compete in China with, and we had a joint venture. Then uh, a few years later, I took then Briggs and Stratton to China, but this time to Chongqing because even at that time the marketplace was changing. And I took them to China for both China and exports with a wholly owned operation. So you can see two big changes. We went west at that time in 2002, and you can see that we went, we went, we got away from a joint venture, went to a wholly owned operation. Uh, and at that time, all those businesses from all three businesses from 91 to 202, we had tax incentives and training support from the government. So now it's 30 years later, and we're kind of gone full circle. ASEAN now is offering the, because ASEAN, and uh, particularly well, ASEAN for sure, had lost a lot of business to China in from like from the mid 90s to 2010. So now ASEAN is offering economic incentives to bring some of those businesses back from China because China, as John says, has changed quite a bit from their economic policies or political policies. And uh, they're really kind of become in some cases um, more nationalistic. So, um, ASEAN. I mean, it's 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 kind of a big deal. It's 800 million people. It's uh, it's it's got great labor, you know, labor struck labor costs, and it varies it varies by country. And we'll talk about that within the 10 countries, as John mentioned. Uh, but it's it, but it's got great consumption. So it's it's really kind kind of similar to what China was, uh, you know, 25 30 years ago. And what it, what is that? It's a large domestic market, 800. 900 million people. Uh, it's got tax incentives. It's got competitive labor rates, et cetera, et cetera. Just like China had in 95, China had about 1.1 million people, GDP of six to 8% growth, and a lot of tax holidays around five years. So um, you got two really big things going. You got good financial incentives in, in ASEAN, and you have great uh, domestic, uh, domestic consumption 
with free trade across the borders, over 800 to a million people. In fact, I think I just read somewhere, ASEAN is the fifth largest economy in the world. So yeah, we'll just we'll just talk about labor just just for a sec. We don't want to you know, spend a lot of time here because we the idea of this this whole presentation isn't really to chase cheap labor. But as you, as you can see, China no China used to be as John says the, the factory of the world. You went there, you had low labor, you you you, you exported out, and then you, you did domestic business if you could as well. Well, uh, as you can see, uh, Vietnam is labor rates are really a third of China. Thailand's are about a half. And then, uh, in, in the case of China and Vietnam, because of this, because of a little bit more of the communist top-down structure, you have really high uh, social benefit packages. And also because of uh, the communist kind of top-down model of telling you what your wage rate should be without having market intervention, you can see it's 10 to 11 percent wage inflation in both China and Vietnam because, again, it's not market driven. Where the rest of the countries, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, you see the benefit package are, are, are more modest and their wage increases are more modest because they actually take the market into consideration. And if the wages get out of line, the products get too expensive, they can't sell. So in turn, they keep the, they keep the wage inflation in, in, in a competitive envelope. Uh, Mark, we've got a question uh, from a company here in Ohio. They've got uh, the common question was they've got a facility in China that's seeing uh, double digit wage increases over the last eight years. Do you expect, you and John expect, the wage increases in China to continue as authorized by the government? And do you see the disparity between China and Vietnam versus the other four countries in Asia? Do you see that disparity growing uh, at the same rate, or do you think that Thailand and Malaysia and Philippines will increase up to China, Vietnam? Yeah, this is Mark. I think China will continue with their wage increases for sure. As John said, they, uh, you know, they they got full employment or getting into close full employment, and they they they're going to want to keep uh, driving higher wages. Uh, as Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, as they pick up some of the benefits uh, that they get back that they lost to China over the last 25, 30 years. Will their wages increase? Uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, will they get up to the, the 10, 11 percent range of, of China? I, I don't think so, because Thailand knows if they get too out, far out of line, then there's Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia. And they both know, and all those guys know if they get their wages too far out of line and the other countries like Laos, Myanmar and Cambodia begin to come on and get their infrastructure in place with their low labor, that they, they would lose business there. So I, I think you have a much more competitive a long-term uh, uh, wage uh, factor in, in the ASEAN countries to keep the market driven that you don't have in China. Let me again just interject one little comment here too. I just saw today that Shanghai has announced that their minimum wage is going to go up just 5% this year. But the wages in Shanghai on average are higher than anywhere else in China. So we can still expect to see close to double digit uh, numbers that, that applies to the minimum wage, but it percolates up all the way, increase expectations in the workforce. Um, it, but it's, that's part of the, 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 the central government's policy is to divide, try to develop a consumer economy there. So they are pushing that issue from a policy standpoint. It's not accidental that those of you that have operations in China are seeing those kind of increases and have for probably the last seven or eight or ten years. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so so you know that was talking uh, talking about 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 labor and how everyone jumped into China 25, 30 years ago. I mean, it's funny. And those of you on on the on the call that have been around Asia for quite a few years. Yeah, there's a historical perspective that could take you far, as far back as Japan, then Taiwan, then then Thailand, and now China, and now it's kind of coming full circle. On 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 corporate tax rates, it's also pretty interesting. Uh, China's 25 percent, Vietnam's 20, Thailand's 20, Philippines 30, Indonesia 25. That in of itself is all pretty competitive amongst amongst themselves. But then you start putting on effective tax rate, which means your other taxes, your VAT. Your, your, your local, your regional taxes, and then you compare that. Uh, Vietnam is about is only about is about half of what what China is. Thailand's also about half 
when it comes to effective tax rates. So you combine competitive labor rates now, and you combine that with effective, very effective tax rates. Again, ASEAN is, I mean, it's, it's no, it's no, uh, it's no uh, secret. ASEAN countries, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines have lost out big time to China over the last 30 years. And now they are trying to get some of that business back as China begins to go in a different direction and the ASEAN countries would like to get some of the business back that is, you know, export driven, that is, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing driven, that's that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and while we're here, we got a question or comment from another company saying that they're in Kunshan and they're seeing about 7% uh, labor increases in the larger suburbs around. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, and Kunshan is a, as John would tell you, he means he's living there day, every day, day in and day out. Kunshan's a quite a, an advanced uh, economy there. They're just, you know, just outside of, out of Suzhou. That whole Jiangsu province area is uh, what eighty million people. Um, it, you know, it's very, you know, becoming quite an expensive place to manufacture. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, so then, so then you just, you, you just kind of look at. Okay, you've got 800 million people, 900 million people, and, and all, all this chart is, you can, you, know, you guys can study it later on, but it really basically says that uh, over the next uh, 20, 15 years, all the country's GDPs in U.S. dollars are, is going to double. That, you know, from 2015 to 2013, 15 years from now, all those kind of GDP are, are going to double, and they're going to average between 5 and 6, 7% a year of GDP growth. So, you know, again, that's again kind of getting this this next chart just shows kind of how big the ASEAN market is, whether it's the fourth or fifth biggest economy in the world. Um, you know, it's 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 free flow of goods. You see uh, you can see it's two point two trillion dollars. You can see ASEAN inner trade, you know, within ASEAN is 24 percent. They, they export to China, 12 percent, United States, 11 percent. You know, Japan, 8%. So big growing economies. The, the issue is going to be which of the 10 ASEAN countries should you invest in? As the issue was in China, not which country, which city. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And then imports, you can see ASEAN is importing 22%. They're getting some of that from China, Japan, et cetera. So all that says, guys, is just a big, big market. So uh, John kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, the, but the plan idea isn't to chase just cheap labor. I mean, labor is just one factor, and you're going to have to really put that into your whole your whole business mix. But yeah, you, you can see on this chart that, of course, Vietnam, Philippines have pretty you know, old. Uh, when it says you know, labor conditions, big bars, that means the labor is good. But you have to, you know, how's your infrastructure? How's your utilities? How's your how's your ports? How's your regulatory environment? How's your your transparency? How's your trade conditions? And what's your risk factors? So you got to take all those in consideration. Uh, in these charts, Malaysia, you can see is probably it's the most expensive labor of all all five of those. But they're also the most uh, advanced as far as regulatory transparency, uh, utilities, infrastructure. Thailand is running a close second, and then as you can see, the other countries are good on labor, but they don't necessarily at this time have the transparency or the infrastructure of Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, Mark, we got a company, I mean, question from a firm, Minnesota. Um, it's a manufacturer, it says industrial products. They've got a facility in China. There's out of that facility, they're serving both China and Asia. Their question is what percentage of Asian sales normally would justify a manufacturing facility in Asia rather than a second facility in China? In other words, if there's a second facility and they've got down 60% ASEAN, 40% China sales. Would that justify it, or how would you figure out if there's a justification? Yeah. I think you'd have to really look at your, you'd have to look at your component supply. Do you have the component supply in the in the non if in the in the non China? What's your freight and if your freight rates? Is it a big product? Is it a large bulk item that you're shipping a lot of air? Where freight may 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 be an issue. Um, you know, what's your technology? How much skilled labor do you really have to have? Um, so, I mean, I hate to say that, you know, the you know, quote unquote, it depends, but it really does 
that's where you have to do your due diligence on both internally what do you need and externally of the countries, which ones of those fit together the best. Right, right, okay. So again, to kind of kind of to wrap up a little bit, um, you know, it's 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 this is this is this is just like uh, again 25, 30 years ago. It's a big opportunity. You have great labor rates in, in in almost all the countries. You've got tax incentives in almost all the countries. But then you have a variety of of infrastructure issues you have to look at, at transparency issues, at perhaps in some countries graft and corruption issues, uh, those kind of things. So as China was 25, 30 years ago, you know, what did you do then? Well, if you, if you had business that was really dominated by the government, uh, in that case, a lot of pharmaceutical business, uh, aer aeronautical business, you went to Beijing. Uh, if you were more into kind of lower tech uh, manufacturing, FMCG, uh, you, went to Guang, you went to Guangzhou. Uh, if you had basic metal bending, a lot of manufacturing, you went to Shanghai, Jiang, the Jiangsu province area, and then subsequently kind of went a little further west. So when it comes to ASEAN, uh, you have to really decide not what city, but which of the 10 countries in ASEAN has the complete package of labor and taxes and, and all the other things we just talked about that fit your requirements the best. Okay, so I'll take back over. Uh, Mark's kind of set the stage here uh, for the kind of the how do you go about doing this phase. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our methodology uh, for expansion into ASEAN, and then Mark will talk about a specific uh, opportunity that we're still in, in the midst of pursuing and, and dealing with. So really, there's four steps. One is to look inside your own company. Uh, introspectively and really detail what it is that you're trying to accomplish by expansion. So as Mark said, it's not all about labor costs and you certainly don't want to base a long-term business strategy on th that you only make money when the government is giving you favorable terms. So you need to think about how's this business going to stand on its own and what are the requirements? Then you can look at multiple countries to see, as you saw in their previous graph, there's a number of different aspects and they're, that are important. And each of those things, and there's many, many others, uh, is gonna have a bearing on your choice, at least uh, zeroing in on one country to, to take a look at, or maybe two in some cases. Then three is a hands-on step, a primary research. Our people in country, for example, can, talk to government officials, they can negotiate for these things. And then finally, and this differentiates us from many other firms, we can actually walk through uh, the whole rollout process and implementation uh, and uh, to make sure that that gets done right. So let's look at the steps now. Uh, again, step one is to develop your company expansions strategy. And that means uh, where are your products going? Where are your raw materials coming from? Who are your customers? Who's your competition and where are they operating? Your own culture and what uh, you can tolerate in terms of, for example, uh, 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 corruption or not. Uh, your processes, can you get the right power and so forth? Or what are those requirements? And detail those so that that then forms a basis for making an objective decision based on the facts that you get later. So that step ends in your expansion objectives and your requirements that can be looked at then to take those 10 countries and maybe narrow that down to two or three or six, depending on what you're looking at. Step two then is to do an in-depth analysis of those different countries to find out how they fit those objective criteria that you already come up with. So all these factors here, you can read uh, below the infrastructure, the uh, transparency, and you get the raw materials that you need. Can you move things around the country? Uh, the government business climate incentives, taxation, and so forth. Those are all things that you can uh, compare on your list in a matrix 
so that you come up with uh, kind of a ranking or rating of the desirability of each of these different countries for your own business under your own requirements. Um, we could gather information. We have local staff in these countries, uh, desktop research, external research, uh, and then that'll come up with a target country eventually. Then the fun begins in step three, which is really getting on the ground in a target country and meeting with the different business parks, industrial development zones, um, talking about what you really require. Can you get what you need there? If you, know, if you, if you need to consume a lot of electricity uh, and you need it um, steady 24 seven, that might rule out some areas in a certain country or might rule out a certain country entirely. Then go look for the space, the site selection process, look at competitive land prices, if, uh, look at construction costs and so forth. And once you get locked in with a particular industrial development zone or industrial estate, as they call them in, in Thailand, that gives you some leverage to go negotiate with customs and tax people to find out what kind of incentives you might get and what your status might be uh, if they've got certain uh, encouraged industries. They, everybody likes high tech. So then uh, just go through the rest of these steps, the government, the tax incentives, uh, labor availability, and then start looking for the construction resources, the designers, the builders, and so forth. And then towards the later in the process, start looking for the staffing uh, uh, so that you have some people that have lived through the development who will stay with you so you have some continuity and it's not just a cold handover. And then all of that will come up with an evaluation and recommendations that will lead to the final step, which is implementation. So that's got several phases. One is plant construction. That can take quite a long time. Uh, again, depending on where you're at, you need to make sure that you're completely legal. You've got permits and licenses. Uh, in most places, you need the business license approved with all the niceties that go along with that before you want to start construction. So parallel through this process is the licensing and development of all the paperwork that's required to get a business license, import, export, and all the other things that, that you're going to need to have. Uh, finding a project management firm, we do uh, kind of the over owner's rep uh, oversight, uh, but the local people are going to do the building and project management and so forth. Um, and then make sure that all of the the buildings put together right, the equipment's put in and designed right, uh, set up, debugged, and turned over to manufacturing, and all the regulation, the uh, inspections from the regulatory people are done. And then staffing, and then all your operations things. So. Uh, again, from soup to nuts, from uh, uh, an idea that you want to go there up to the point where you've got a more or less turnkey plan is a kind of assistance that we do through a very rigorous process. So I'll go back to Mark and he'll tell you how this works in real life. Sure. Yeah, so yeah, let's we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about a, a case study that we're, we're actively involved in as, as we speak. Okay, there you go. So yeah, one of our clients, uh, we've, we've been working with them in China for probably six, seven years now, eight years, something like that. It's a large global manufacturer of appliances, USA, China, Europe, actually quite quite dominant in, in their space, a billion dollar company. Uh, they've been in Fujian province uh, for the last five, six years. Uh, actually, they acquire an, an operation there and it's been growing 12 to 15% a year for the last three to five years. And they had really maxed out their capacity, but their, their production capacity based on, on the, 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 physical, the physical part of the, of the building. Uh, so, so their growth was still, their, their global growth uh, again, billion dollar company was was primarily in Asia. I mean, USA was good, Europe was good, but the Asia business was really growing well for them. So they needed to figure out a way to, to increase production capacity. It was it was, it was mandatory. They they needed a factory. So either they had to increase their factory in, in Ripon, which 
they didn't really want to do because I had them too far away from the market and they had some constraints there. Uh, the European market was running full, full uh, company, I should say, or, or facility was running full out. So they needed a facility 10 times larger in Asia than they presently had in, in Fujian province. Uh, you know, a couple 200,000 square feet, a uh, couple 200 employees to 300 employees. First phase, uh, 200, 150 production staff, uh, 50 white collar management staff. They liked they were they were they they didn't really have an issue in when in in, in in with Fujian province. They and they 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 uh, asked us originally to to do a uh, kind of a site study for them to uh, to really understand where they should should they put their new facility. Should they put it in the same area? Should they put it in different regions of China? Uh, then we had some other ideas for them. So yeah, so we, you know, again, we continued looking internally and uh, in step one was, well, a couple of things came up that they were of their plans presently and going forward, they'd only anticipated selling about 15% of their Asia consumption in China. Uh, they had strong, you know, their sales projections were quite strong in Indochina, frankly, still strong in China, but still only 15% of total. Uh, as in all businesses, they had to be competitive. They had competition. They had to keep their prices in line. And they, these were large, sophisticated uh, pieces of equipment that sold anywhere between five and $10,000 a piece. So they really had to uh, understand who could build that, where could they build it, uh, who had the, the technical skill sets of labor so their expansion criteria was, you know, obviously they had to keep their costs in line. They wanted some government incentives. Their inflation rates of raw materials was, was, was important. Um, so based on the fact that they didn't have to be in China, we proposed and they accepted we do a, a six country study, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and China. And we put together, you know, based on their input, uh, some, some, some weighted focuses. You know, and how incentives were important, labor costs were important, labor supply was important, inflation rates, availability of raw materials, uh, you know, again, domestic market size, uh, ease of doing business, uh, uh, skilled labor, et cetera. Going through all of that in over a, about a six week, eight week period, we put together, a, and then our, we, our, our recommendation based on all that criteria, based on what they needed was Thailand was where they should where they should put their their their, their new facility. Uh, Mark, we got a question that came in uh, was was around the analysis of the six elected countries. Uh -huh. um, yep. Which was did we consider putting in Laos, uh, Myanmar, and Cambodia were the three countries they brought yeah. up? Yeah, so, yeah. So we kind of touched on that a, a little earlier. If you if you were just to chase labor, kind of as kind of as John was saying, then you would have thought about those areas, but they, for this type of product, again, $10,000, highly internet connected, highly technical, a lot of electronics, a lot of uh, remote monitoring. Uh, our feeling was at the time, uh, Lao, Cambodia, Myanmar did not have the sophisticated skill sets and labor to, uh, to, to produce the product. And then the infrastructure, of course, was, was a secondary issue. However, people should and need to keep their eye on that because if if your if your analysis says you don't need highly skilled labor, you don't need uh, a lot of electronics. Uh, you, you know you can you can use it a little more hands-on manual labor type production, which is it was not. Then Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia, you know uh, may you know w well they will at some point in time as they develop their infrastructure to move up move up that that chain. But for our for our client at this time, no, that would they that would not have fit. Okay, and then another question on that was around talking about the, the labor supply. Uh, the question was, was from a company uh, manufacturing Midwest. They do a lot of basically it's it's welding, a lot of welding operation, uh, a lot of metal stamping. And they were asking around when you do the analysis. We did the analysis for this client. Did we get to the level of looking at uh, skill sets for engineers and for skilled workers like? Someone who could who could manage a lathe, or people who could who could get to the point of uh, uh, servicing as high level blue collar blue collar individuals. Yeah, yeah, good question. I asked you a great great question. So first thing you, we did was, and, and again, a lot of it's just inherent knowledge. When, as I mentioned, if you go back in early charts, you know, I I moved out there in '91. I've been traveling there since the '83 '84. 
So we knew based on our our client, if if you could if if there was a vertically integrated autom automotive uh, industry nearby, then the, we knew those skill sets were there. We also knew that if there was then we so the case of Philippines, case of of Thailand, uh, in the case of Malaysia, a, an established auto industry was there with the uh, with the, the the training programs and the local university trade schools to support sophisticated welding metal bending lasers cnc machines th things of that nature uh so uh having the auto industry there as the first cut and then so then when we did when we did the studies of course we're into thailand we're in the, what they call the eec and uh we're down there visiting to be quite frank visiting uh you know uh, automotive first tier suppliers, visiting Caterpillar, visiting uh, other companies that are in the home appliance business and talking with them. So we were able to, to neck that down rather quickly and, and, and came back very confident that uh, in the case of the EEC, which is the Eastern Economic Corridor a community south of Bangkok, 100 miles, uh, which has a fully integrated auto industry. Every, every auto company that I know of, every foreign brand is there. Uh, the appliance brands are there. The HVAC brands are there. All all have supporting skilled labor that could that could do what our what our company wanted. Uh, and but Philippines was similar. Malaysia was similar. Uh, Vietnam to a lesser degree, and that's why they didn't make the final cut. Frankly, was weren't as confident confident as far as skilled labor and component supply. All right. The same company asked about. Uh, political stability when we're looking at these countries how, how do you gauge political stability if yeah you've got yeah uh, another good question so we have uh, there's indexes you know uh, uh you know uh, indexes that rate political risk things of that nature um you know we all know that you know like china and vietnam are kind of top down so they're they keep kind of control on things a little bit tighter uh thailand is uh is thailand has been a great business community for for again since long before i even moved there but I, even, when i started going there in the 80s they've always understood you know how to take care of business whether it's tourism or manufacturing now the top the, t the government has gone through different different hands and as you know right now they're they're being run by a, a kind of a one-party system a general prayut however they have never forgotten about how important business is how important tourism is how important foreign trade is so uh but you have to watch that you have to watch the philippines they have every country's got certain issues some countries china gets rated very very uh a low as far as when it comes to transparency on on kind of kickbacks things you know red envelope sort of stuff to suppliers companies like uh, countries like thailand get a little bit beat up more on more the government type uh it, type graph, which would be customs and port authorities, where that can be a, some type of a, of a problem. One of the one of the nice things about, and we'll talk about it in a second, we went into an industrial estate, strong, well-known, prominent industrial estate who has a lot of lot of a uh, lot of sway with with the government because they bring so much business that allows a little bit more ease of doing business. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. So yeah, as, so, so kind of just what, what I just mentioned, I guess. So yeah, we there's more than two large industrial industrial states, but two of them for sure. We uh, we visited, you know, several you know several states, uh, five potential sites, necked it down to two, did some preliminary soil testing. Again, kind of what this what process three and four is. Process one and two is kind of the it's not desktop. You have to go into country, but it's not at the 100 foot level either it's more at the uh you know the thousand foot level three and four we're down at the five foot level and this is really what separates east west from a lot of other consultants we we can advise you what you should do and then we can help you do it if you don't have the internal resources so we able to pick out the land we negotiated uh for the for the land and and, and the pricing and all that that sort of thing we also then got deep into this with the, what they call the thailand board of investment and negotiated the, the corporate tax incentives and in the, the holidays. Uh, so we, we, we purchased the land, uh, we negotiated and secured a very, a very aggressive uh, uh, corporate tax uh, policy. Uh, we interviewed and qualified architects and engineers, three of them interviewed and qualified three general contractors, interviewed and qualified four project management firms, as well as executive recruiters, 
part of our part of our challenge or part of our charge, I should say, is not only did they ask us to tell them where, where they should go, then they asked us to go ahead and help them do it. Then they asked us to go ahead and build the facility. Then they asked us to go ahead and staff it and train. So we did we did all that and we gave them all the recommendations. And then, frankly, what happened after we came back with all that all that information, they presented everything to the board, uh, and the, and it was approved for I think as a fifty million dollar investment. That six months earlier they had fully had planned on putting that investment into China, and then and then based on our studies, based on our recommendations, they put that uh, they put that investment into uh, into Thailand. So we're, we're so hands on again. We're you know, we, 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 as John said, we've you got to you got to get the permits right. You have to be legal. You have to have building permits. You have to have occupancy permits. You have to have all that sort of stuff. And if you don't if, if you don't do that, you've got a big problem. So we pulled all the permits, license registrations, uh, land, uh, BOI incentives, etc. All last October. Now, we started this pro problem, this process in June of 20 at uh, June of 2017. So by October, November, the four, four, five, six months, we bought the land, negotiated the incentives, uh, started doing preliminary preliminary site work. Uh, now we're putting pilings in as we speak, and our plan is to have production ready April 29. Uh, we're beginning to order equipment, and we'll be setting the equipment once the roof is on. And we're and right now we're we're interviewing senior management. We need we need to hire a project. Uh, a, pardon me, an MD to run the facility. That MD is going to need a finance director. It's going to need a uh, an operations person. It's going to need an HR person. So we're in the process of doing all that right now. Okay, we had a, a, another question come in and said, is it reasonable as a foreign national company to expect English to be the working language of a manufacturing operation in these countries? Or is bilingual an absolute necessity to find the best available talent. Well, you know, certainly you want to be, you know, on your, you know, let, let's let's just take a, a manufacturing facility and say you're you're three level, you're four levels deep. You have your operators, you have your supervisors, you have your managers, you have your 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 your, your project engineers. All those levels are Thai. In this case, it's Thai. Thai speaking to Thai. And does your MD? Is, is, does your MD have to be a, a, a fluent Thai speaker? No. I mean, there's a lot of expatriate managers that have gone over there who, who don't speak fluent Thai. But if, 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 if you can find a person that can speak fluent Thai and has a, has a skill set to run, you know, to go five, four or five levels deep in the organization down to the operator level, that's certainly a plus. And the interesting thing about that, that's a great question. 25, 30 years ago, you couldn't find that. You could not find a Thai person or a Chinese person, frankly, that had the skill set to run, you know, a fifty million dollar facility that spoke English as well as uh, and and and, and, uh, and could run the facility. Thirty years have gone by. Thirty years of, of managers, Chinese or Thai or Malaysian, working for multinationals, growing up and in, in growing up. Now there are uh, uh, many many locals who have the language and the skill set to be your MDs. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. So, what's the short of the whole story? And this is all information, quite frankly, that uh, the our client presented uh, internally with to, to to their board. So, what what were we able to negotiate with the uh, with the board of the board of investment in Thailand? We were able to negotiate on the behalf of our client an eight year tax holiday, meaning no tax for the first eight years for corporate income tax. And an additional five years at fifty percent. The best when we did the study in China, uh, as because we did that was one of the six countries. The best we could get to was Changzhou, outside of uh, outside of Nanjing, and the best park we could we could find that would that would give us anything was three years at fifty percent. So this was uh, now this this is a very high tax uh, incentive, one of the highest within the board of investment, and it's because. We were bringing technology. We were bringing sophisticated machines. We were bringing uh, what they call the 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 the, the uh, 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 global monitoring, uh, uh, the way to run these machines from you know from from the from from the from the clouds, so, so to speak. They all heavy, uh, very heavily electronic uh, controlled. So that was one of the reasons. That's what Thailand. We were also be, we also were able to bring in to get this a training center to have 
to have uh, and, and to have an R and D center. R and D center is going to have twenty five degree engineers doing 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 uh, uh, design and engineering in Ch in Thailand with their products. And of course, BOI, the EEC, that's you know what they call their four That's stuff that they're really interested in. Are we bringing in sophisticated products? Are we training their people? Are we bringing in value added? Are we bringing the internet Internet of Things to, to Thailand? And the answer with our client on this was yes, yes, yes. So in turn, frankly, we got the second highest tax. There's like seven tax or six tax categories of incentives, and we got the second from the top at eight years and at, and then 50% at five years. What are that? So when they did their analysis and it compared it with, to what they could have done in China uh, based on over 10 years, they had $22 million in tax savings. They had $4.3 million of labor savings after five years based on, on more competitive labor rates. And, and the tax savings is, of course, based on the tax holidays. 1.8 uh, annual material savings as they were able to were able to find very low cost uh, suppliers of their components and an average uh, a unit cost of freight savings of $120 because of their growth in Southeast Asia with these large pieces of equipment. And what did that lead to? It led to, you know, uh, they, they believe they're going to grow this business 42% uh, over the next five years in, in, in sales and 53% in revenue over the same five years. So um, everyone's quite excited about this. And, uh, and, uh, and ASEAN is, and certainly the EEC in Thailand and the Board of Investment and the industrial states were very excited about to getting it, to getting a, a world-class company, number one in, in their industry and a $50 million investment. Uh, Mark, I had a question uh, from uh, one of the question was, do you see, they're specifically talking about the government incentive you listed up here, uh, yeah. here in the, and then the addition 50% for additional five years. The question was, is Thailand um, and the other Asian countries, obviously they're remaining hungry. The question was, do you see China trying to go back and offer bigger incentives in the future as some of these countries are, are leaving China or putting in a second facility, but that's not in China, but in ASEAN? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to act like I'm an expert on in because, you know, a global economist, so to speak. but. Um, yeah, what's going on in China today is 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 they're promoting their local brands. They're promoting a little more more nationalist nationalistic, and I believe, and John might be able to also to kick in on this that unless you have something very unique, some some unique special formula or a, or a unique mousetrap, China uh, isn't going to be offering these things because they can they would sooner give them to their 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 own domestic companies and. Um, and I, I think that uh, those 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 lucrative days in China are behind us. Yeah, I, let me just jump in. I would agree 100 percent. China is on a trajectory at this point for being very high techy. And, you know, they have kind of created conditions that have driven out the high labor content, kind of, you know, cheap labor industries and even in the state-owned enterprises, you see very high-tech stuff in the metal bending industry where I come from. You got laser cutters and plasma cutters and and uh, automated uh, bending machines and things like that. There's, you know, raw metal at one end and product out the other end that you would never expect to see there. So I think they've reached another trajectory there that is is. Um, not going to revert back. And at the same time, uh, you know, part of their strategy for incentives was to learn and to get know-how on how to do different um, uh, high techy things or just the more efficient automated processes. So having learned that now, the domestic Chinese companies, private or public, uh, or state-owned enterprises, for that matter, are developing their own advanced processes. You know, China just built a, a airliner. China sent missiles into space. So I think they are, and, and they're very focused on domestic innovation. So all of those factors taken together, I think, say that China is not going to um, look for a handout from the rest of the world, and they're they're really 
getting in a position to be very quite dominant and very innovative over the next 10 to 15 years. Great, thank you. So, so last, we just want to look at uh, ASEAN in a nutshell and just evaluate um, what we have. We're, we know, for example, the the uh, country obviously is going to be it's one of the fast growing economies. We know it's got a normal growth, significant economic benefit, financial benefits. We covered in uh, the advantages for strong uh, company growth. Um, the uh, the due to the market diversity, though, uh, we've got a long term expansion. The structure process is kind of vital to a long term success. Um, we're we just had a question come in, so let me read that. Um, the question was, they are using environmental regulatory policies to make metal bending a less economic practice, less economic practice in China as well, from water uh, affluent permit submissions very challenging. That was a comment from one of the participants on the on the um, uh, speaker. And I, uh, the, for the company that made that, I would uh, agree 100%. We're seeing that on a number of the companies we're working with uh, from all across them. Uh, all across the perspectives, chemical sectors all the way across. We've had a number of clients who have lost uh, effectively the enforcement of, of environmental regulatory policy in China has forced affected them as far as their raw material supplies. Some of them have had to pick up and relocate because they want the government's going to push them into certain kind of industry sectors, excuse me, in certain kind of business parks. So the enforcement of environmental assessment is having a big effect not only in supply chain, but on production, but also on site selection. We just went through a site selection for another chemical client, and it was, we got the last spot in a, in a, a zone in near Nantong. Um, it was a much more challenging site selection process because those parks that are not designated are still trying to keep you if they can. So the company who made that comment, I, I would definitely agree with that. The, we're looking at Asia in a nutshell. Um, Here's what we've got. You've got 800 million people. You've got a five, six GDP growth. You got the tax incentives there, the pro growth. We've obviously talked about the incentives where the client that we're putting over there for the Midwest is getting 8% and then 5% additional taxes um, reduction. The company that are or that we're dealing with, each country within Australia obviously offers a different combination of tax incentives, infrastructure components, skilled labor, skilled labor issues. The key to doing this and that we did for this client was to go through a detailed company business analysis for each country and then determine which ASEAN market allows you the opportunities for profitable growth and be able to compare that with what you're doing in China. Um, that is really the nutshell. Most, a lot of companies we see doing this either have existing operations in China um, and putting in the facility in ASEAN or they're exporting companies that are exporting back to Europe, exporting back to the U.S., and they're seeing their costs increase significantly in China. All right, well, I know we have uh, has said we would have this completed in an hour. Uh, it's definitely within an hour. Uh, so we wanted to go ahead and be able to wrap up. We will be forwarding everyone a copy of this presentation as well as the recording. Thank you for all the questions. If you have any questions for us, please seek John's information by contact information here, and please uh, let us know. Uh, again, thank you very much for attending this East-West webinar, um, and we will be signing off now. Thank you.